Welcome to the Green Wasp Removal YouTube channel. This is part two of Killing Honeybees, When Somebody's Gotta Do It. Please see part one for a full explanation about why these bees had to be exterminated. We were able to relocate most of this hive, but there were some honeybees that we couldn't save, and that's just the reality of the business. Today's March 15th, 2024. It's about 44 degrees, cool morning, beautiful blue skies. And we're gonna check on our bees again in this tree. We had to exterminate some of the last holdouts the other day, so we're coming back in to check and see if any of them survived. We brought along the soap and water and essential oil spray, non-toxic, but very effective. Same one we used last time we were here. And we brought along the scope cam to take a look inside the nest. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we're back on scope cam. We're pulling the bag, the plastic, out of the hole that we used to block the entrance. You can see a lot of wax built up around the entry exit hole that they were using because they had balled up in there the last time we had been out to do an extraction. They, they were trying to escape the extraction hose and they were trying to escape the spray we eventually used during extermination. But here you see them again. There's more in there. We're not sure if they were hiding somewhere and they showed up again now or if they're just more being born every day from the nest that we're pupating out. Either way, there's more in there, and we can't reach them to do a vacuum extraction. If you saw part one, and we encourage you to look at that to understand why these bees are being killed, exterminated, instead of being rescued. It's because we can't get to them to rescue them, and we have to make this tree safe so the residents are no longer in danger. The challenge with a situation like this is you can only rescue so many of the bees. If you can't reach them to rescue them with the vacuum extraction hoses, there's no way to get them out. We can't do a trap out this time of year. Uh, we have to get this thing out of here, the whole nest, as soon as possible. It's about to be warm weather. We've already had some pretty warm days. Fortunately, the vast majority of this hive has already been rescued and placed with a beekeeper. So these are just the last few holdouts that crawled up into an area in the tree that we could not rescue. So they have to be exterminated now. Obviously, nobody likes killing honeybees. It's only done as a last resort to make a property safe. We rescued as many as we can. We can't get the rest of them out. The only option left is to exterminate because there's no viable way to save these bees. You just can't leave a nest like this growing in a tree. It's a feral hive. It could become very aggressive. It could become Africanized. You just never know. And the safety and the risk uh, has to be weighed. So once you rescue what you can, and you just do your basic due diligence to make that happen, once that process is over, it's time to just kill whatever's left in that nest and get this place safe. The nature of the work that we do is very simple. You can't save them all. You can do your best, but you're never going to save them all. Okay, so we're rigged up with the scope cam over here in the side again. The side hole is what they've been using for their exit and entry most recently. On the other side of the tree over here, we have the access point for our hose that we're going to use to spray. This is the spray applicator on a jug filled with soap and water and essential oils, kind of a peppermint oil, clove oil mix. And what you can see here is the bees are hitting this screen real hard on the other side. The camera there, the scope cam, is inside their nest with a bright light. They don't like that, so they're attacking it, so they're making it hard to see anything on that screen at the moment. So we're just going to start spraying the solution here through the other side of the tree. We move this plastic plug. And we're going to take a look down in there and see if there's any activity on this side of the tree, first of all. Not too much. a little bit happening but not too much so let's start spraying them and see how it goes test the applicator looks good okay sorry bees not much visible on that screen right now unfortunately there we go Looks like we might have hit a few. They're starting to look shiny and wet. Like they're getting some spray. It's 
and fast will it tell really where we're at inside the nest with this situation. That's the problem with these limited access spots. But obviously the ones here have been hit. It's a pretty good intense spray we're giving them. But we're shooting kind of blind. That's the problem. Can't tell what we're hitting or what we're not hitting. Because right now the screen is just blocked by the bees. Try to spray up and spray down and spray both sides and just hope we're hitting something we need to hit. Okay, now that we've done some application with the sprayer, we're going to go ahead and go back in with the scope cam on this side and see if we see anything. So here on the scope cam footage, you can see that this soap and water mix with essential oil knock these bees right down. They are dying or dead in literally just a few seconds, a couple of minutes, they're gone. And the reason we show you these videos is not to glorify the killing of bees or anything like that. It's strictly to show you green ways to take care of the extermination of honeybees in the rare instances that you just can't get to them, but they have to be removed. The best way to do this is without toxics. You don't need poisons of any kind. Biodegradable soap and water and essential oils are all you need, as you can see here. Just like wasps, bees breathe through their abdomen through small pores called spiracles, and if you clog that up with soap and water, they simply can't breathe and they immediately expire. Just be aware, you have to knock them down physically and hit them with the spray it's not going to leave a residual toxic poison anywhere in that tree cavity. So you may have to return to knock down whatever else comes in later. This is the trade-off for being environmentally responsible with what you do. If you spray into the access hole, Really try to saturate it in there. So as you can see with the scope cam that we put in later, within just a few seconds, there's barely anything moving in there. You can see one or two bees here that were able to avoid getting hit directly with the spray. So they're still moving around in there and that's gonna happen pretty much every time you spray. That's why you have to spray multiple times and in multiple directions throughout the cavity space you're working in. And you need to be willing to put in the work. I see one live bee, there's a couple down there. Everything else we see is dead. So we're back a couple hours later to check on them. Everything inside the nest appears to be dead, except for maybe one or two little live bees we saw just barely slogging around in there. Can't really see anything from outside without the scope cap.
Here we put the scope cam down again into the nest and just to verify that the spray worked and everything we see is now deceased. Nothing's moving. There's a lot of casualty bees that we can see that were affected by the spray. The nest is broken up a little bit and less viable. All of the comb is becoming less able to support a colony and that's the point of all of this stuff is we want that colony all the inaccessible bees that we can't reach for rescue to be gone See what's going on in the top. That was the bottom of the cavity. Now we're going to look at the top of the cavity. There's some more casualties from the spraying. Let's see if we can get further up there to find out where they're hiding. don't see any live bees at all. So the question is, where are they? When you see deceased bees inside a tree trunk, it's difficult to tell if this is all of them or if some of them have run into an inaccessible part of the tree. And we came to find out later that's exactly what happened. We found another pocket of them tucked away higher up in the tree, and you'll see that later in the video. So here on the left side of frame you can see a couple of live bees still hiding out in this upper corner of the comb. They have a lot of little nooks and crannies they can hide out in. This is why you have to go in and spray over and over again and you're always spraying kind of blindly and you just have to try your best to hit every part of that interior cavity and you go back several days in a row if you have to to make sure you got every last bee. Here you see most of them are already dead but there's always some that survive and you, you just have to run them down. It only takes one bee, literally, to kill somebody with a severe venom allergy. It's on us to find them. So right now we're just hitting it hard with the soap and water and oil spray. Just kind of filling it up with suds and that way whatever's left alive in there will hopefully suffocate on the soap bubble residue. The soap and water and oil, we can get that to fill up the cavity 
foam it out that hopefully can reach the ones we're missing now that are holed up in little crevices above and below the nest. So we're giving it max pressure to make a lot of suds in there, foam it up quite a bit, and that helps get a lot more foam out. Just about out of juice. It's down to about air now. But with every little bit of foam we can get in there will help. That's about it. It looks like most of the remaining nest is above the knot hole where we've been spraying. So when I turn the camera upwards, that's when we tend to see more comb. So we need to find some wire, maybe, to come in at an angle and try to knock that comb out. I don't see any live bees anymore, but that doesn't mean much. So we don't know where they are. They could just be hiding in there, but I don't hear them, I don't see them. And that's usually the case after we've gone in and sprayed like this. Well, we were working in this side with the scope cam. Uh, we just saw a bee come bombing out at us and bounced right off the face veil. Very aggressive, straight out, straight into the face, tried to sting immediately. That's why you always have to have protection, always. I would have just taken a sting to the eye or the face um, it came right out straight at me. So it bounced off the veil. But the good news is we got to see it flew around and then crawled in that space. This is what we've been looking for, is where else they were coming in and out. Well, guess what? We found one coming in and out right there. So we're going to see how that works out. All right, so we're going to put the scope cam in there. We'll see what it shows us. Hey, little bees. There's some bees. And sure enough, with the scope in that side of the tree, in a little hole we didn't know about, we found some bees. So this will give us a spot to begin trying to figure out how to deal with these guys because they're up in a pretty inaccessible spot but there's a number of them in there so let's go ahead and work on dealing with them they're definitely able to fly and attack today so we'll see if they come bombing out trying to get us no we're trying to get them no hard feelings dudes we do the same thing somebody came for us you fight back hard as you can So here's some scope cam footage of that new entry hole that we found when that one bee came out so aggressively and tried to sting us in the face. That bee turned around and flew back into the tree, but it went in a different hole than it came out of. And then we discovered a new hole that had been covered up by the ivy leaves, so we didn't even know it was there. So that worked out pretty well. It led us to where the rest of the bees were. But again, it would have been a sting possibly right to the eye had we not had full bee suit on. So always wear protection. That's the bottom line when you're dealing with these feral hives. Or really any beehive that could become more aggressive than it used to be. Which is the case with most bees these days. Feral hives all over the south part of the United States are becoming more and more aggressive, more and more Africanized as the years go by. And climate change is warming up the world. It's making it easier for these hybrid Africanized bees to survive and take over more European hives. It's going to be part of our future in the northern part of this country, whether we want it or not. So we need to be ready. There's more news reports every year 
about bees in the northern half of the country becoming very aggressive, attacking beekeepers, attacking civilians, attacking people out of the blue. It's just going to be part of what we're going to have to learn to deal with. That is not a popular opinion among people in the bee business, honey business, big ag who depends on bee pollination, all of that sort of thing. There is a bit of a quiet conspiracy about how many northern bees are becoming aggressive. They're kind of keeping that a little bit under wraps politically. And like all things on the internet, don't take our word for it. Do your own research. You'll see what we mean. Scientists know this is happening. They're studying this. You can find research papers on this. You can find active current studies happening right now, looking at the aggressive bees in the northern half of the country. One study in Pennsylvania that was small showed 25% of the colonies they sampled had 20% Africanization. These are historically cold weather states that people didn't believe these bees could live in if they're Africanized or aggressive. There's more and more news reports every year in northern states such as Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, where super aggressive honeybees were attacking people so intensely they required the fire department to come out and hose people down to rescue them and save their lives. Most people don't even realize that as early as the 1990s in the USA, they were doing studies that proved Africanized bees, the hybrids from South America that came up originally, could survive cold weather. These are true hybrids that picked up the ability to adapt to the cold like European bees, and the hybrids picked up the aggressive temperament of the African bees. So if anybody actually bothers to look into the research papers, the news reports, the anecdotal evidence that's coming in year after year, it's pretty obvious that Africanized bees are not only moving north, but they can adapt to the cold. So while the bees in this video, for example, are probably not Africanized, the fact is nobody knows because in a lot of places, nobody's bothering to check in the north. And that's a mistake. Those policies of not checking at all are going to come back to haunt us in the form of people getting attacked. For example, in the state of Indiana, they passed a law in 2019 to make it illegal for local ordinances to ban small-time beekeepers from neighborhoods. So if you're not even going to bother to check if those local neighborhood beekeepers have hot hives that have Africanized genetics, you can assume that across the fence from your kid's play structure, there could be a killer bee colony raised by your neighbor. And technically, from state law, it is illegal for your town council to make a ban on that beekeeper. And we're here to tell you, as public policy, maybe that's not a great idea. If you're going to make it illegal for suburban neighborhoods to ban beekeepers, you better make sure you've got a legion of inspectors that can check every single hive for Africanized genetics. And it's unlikely anybody's going to be willing to raise their taxes to pay for inspectors. So get ready not only for Africanized bees in your neighborhood, but for basically unregulated Africanized beekeepers. While state and local ordinances may ban Africanized bees on paper, if they're not inspecting or registering all the beehives, nature's going to take its course. So there's no mandatory laws in this state to allow the state to even know how many of its citizens are raising bees, much less how many of those bees might show Africanized genetics. So the current policy, at least around here, seems to be we'll just take an official stance that we don't want Africanized bees in Indiana, but we're not really going to lift a finger to prevent it. We're not going to make it mandatory to register bees in backyard beekeeping hives. We're not going to do anything. We're basically just going to stand by and let the future victims of killer bees get thrown under the bus. All right, so let's see how this group reacts when we start spraying up here. So here you can see how the last bees hiding up in the corner of this tree reacted when we started to spray in the other holes we actually had access to. We weren't quite able to hit them directly, but they were affected by the spray eventually because it started to trickle down to where they were after we tried to spray up in the high corners blindly uh, using the applicator we stuck into one of the small holes in the tree. Uh, fortunately, it was just enough spray to drip down on them to start affecting them. You can see them become more agitated here, but it, it's unclear exactly where they ran to. If they all just got hit eventually and perished in this particular spray application, or if they found another place to hide. That's the problem with the scope cam. We have very limited view inside the tree, and you just have to do the best you can. All we could tell for sure was that there was fewer and fewer active bees. And eventually, as you'll see in the video later here, there's almost no activity in that nest anywhere. 
So despite being in a pretty well protected spot inside the very high corner of the tree cavity, eventually we got enough of the spray onto their area there that they fled or died. Unfortunately, they are in a spot that we can't quite get to. So if you look carefully here, you can start to see some of the soapy water and oil dripping down onto this part of the nest. Finally, we were starting to get close enough where we could see on the screen that it was starting to affect them. When you do this kind of work, you never really know if they're finding another place to run that's equally inaccessible. So you just have to adapt to the situation moment by moment and be as thorough as you can. And we really cannot stress enough that it was the fact that we were wearing a bee suit during this removal job that kept us from getting stung in the eye or in the mouth or the face somewhere, which easily could have knocked us out of the tree or ended the work. And we never would have found that the bee went back into the tree into this particular area where we still needed to find them and take them out. So again, PPE not only takes care of you, but it allows you to do your job better and more professionally and more thoroughly. PPE, personal protective equipment, if you work without it, you're just working in a less professional way. That's the bottom line. So here, as you can see, there's fewer and fewer bees hanging on in this particular part of the nest. And it was just through rote, try after try after try, not giving up, and following what the bees were telling us and staying in the game until the job was done that made this a success. We hear all the time from clients that we help that they tried calling other companies, other pest control operators who would come in, do a half-assed job, not complete the job, or do it improperly, and the problem simply did not go away. And they had to pay for that no matter how crappy the service was. So not only were they ineffective, but they also dumped poison all over these clients' properties. And that's how we eventually get these calls a lot of the time because people are fed up with getting poisoned and watching this not work. So we come in and we do a green removal and we work until the job is completed. It's quality of work and protection of our biosphere and our environment over profit, period. Here you can see we're finally starting to get the solution into this part of the nest. It's dripping down the comb there in the center, and the spray is starting to foam up and come down to the right side of the screen. You can see some of it start to dump down into where the bees are. And this is very important. You, you just have to keep trying and come up with alternative ways to do the job until you get it done. And within just a few minutes of that time, there was no more activity visible. So after some serious spraying with this soap and oil mix, we have no more activity even up here where they were. So they must have either, either been hit uh, or they fled further up into some area we can't reach. But in the meantime, let's go ahead. Let's remove the camera. Let's get the scope cam out for a minute. And we'll replace it with this hose. So now we've got three points of entry that we know about. One, two, three, all on different sides of the tree. So they're all plugged up now. We have applied a whole bunch of soap and water and essential oil to all three holes. We no longer see any live bees in any of these points of entry. So there is one more way up there. If you see that, it's about 
uh, maybe three feet, maybe four feet higher than this old main entry hole. If we can reach that one, it'd be great to get some scope cam imagery in there to see what is up higher in the tree. They may have fled up there. So we'll take a look in there if we can reach it. It's gonna take some climbing. So this climb's gonna be a little sketchy because we are a ways up the tree and the ladder. We should be able to get a foothold up here somewhere. Okay, so here's our next hole. Looks pretty deep. Looks like it would be a good spot for them to go. See if anybody's in there. I don't see anyone in there yet. But let's send in the scope cam. Sometimes you just have to do some tree climbing. You know, it's one of those jobs. So you do your best, have good insurance. All right, let's see where else they might be sneaking in or out. I don't see anything obvious, but there's a lot of vine coverage which was hiding that other hole until we removed the leaves. So there could be some others. But for now, that's what we see. Let's see if we can get the scope in there. So here's some scope footage when we explored that next hole. Luckily, there wasn't a huge cavity as part of this hole, but we did find enough small spaces that a bee could get through that it may be possible for them to climb up to this hole or fly into this hole and kind of work their way down through these tiny little tunnels into the larger tree cavity. And being within a few feet of their other main entry holes, we wanted to go ahead and plug it up just to be safe. So here we are risking life and limb today, all in the name of science, of course. We're kind of precariously perched in a tree here. Uh, a little further off the ground than I care to think about, but basically we're not seeing a whole lot in this other hole, which is way up above the other one we were working on, which is down here. So the feeling is these bees probably can't get down here. We scoped out this one hole with the scope cam. And it didn't look like this was going to be an access point, but we're going to plug it anyway because there is a tiny little tunnel they could chew their way down there into the main tree trunk again. And we're just trying to make it as difficult as possible to live here. So let's try and get out of this tree alive and then we'll uh, see how we're doing. Okay, so way up there are the holes we're talking about. So I'm going to have to get back up there and plug that hole. So this pine cone is about the right size to fill that hole. So we're gonna climb back up here and see if this will work on this whole way up top. Here we go, another day in the life. Maybe the last day in the life. All right, I'm going to have to shut this camera off or risk death, so we'll see in a minute. All right, so we got this pine cone just crammed into there as far as we can get it, and that'll plug it up good enough for now, just so it's not easy for a bee to jump back in there. So on this day, the last part of the job was going to be taking a piece of old electrical wire cable and try to use that as a battering ram to knock down some of the comb structure that was still inside the nest. The more you beat up the comb, the more you make it difficult for these bees that are still hanging out in there to survive. So we show you here the scope cam view of what we were trying to do with this probe. We were trying to knock that comb that remained into several pieces and, and just sort of beat it up in there and disconnect it from the side of the tree cavity and all that. It ended up not working great because it was just a little too short. So we're gonna to have to go in there with some longer, rigid, uh, sort of rebar-like tools and really knock the heck out of some of that comb, however much we can reach. It's gonna be a little difficult to find much of it in there, but you know, you gotta do what you can. And that's what you see here, just field expedient tools that, that might or might not do the job. 
You gotta keep trying. Find a way to get it done. As we explored the nest at the end of the day, there were no more bees at all active in the nest. We couldn't find any. Everything we saw looked just like this. They were deceased inside the tree, right where we had sprayed them. That technique works very, very well. It's just plain super effective, and it's not toxic. As you can see here, we went into where we saw them climbing up higher in the tree after we'd sprayed in there. Absolutely no motion, no activity, nothing. So this battle was won, but as for the war, it may be ongoing. We'll have to check it again in a couple of days. As always, with green applications, this is just a temporary knockdown of the problem insect inside that cavity. The tree cavity itself will recover. The products are biodegradable, and that cavity will support life again in the near future. So to be thorough, you have to go back and make sure any bees that might have been missed do not attempt to reestablish a nest in there. That's part of the job, part of being thorough, doing green work. But at least for this day, there were no more bees in that cavity alive that we could see, not one. After we'd reapplied several times, even the one or two that we'd see here and there, they were all gone. Looks like most of the bees are deceased. So we gave it one last spray. As you see here, we got the scope cam inside the tree while we were doing a little spraying so you can see what that looks like up close. And once this process was done, we call the quits for the day. And we'll be back in a day or two to make sure that there's no more bees trying to reestablish a nest or any pupating bees that came out of the brood cells that are new bees trying to repopulate the nest. All right, it's Saturday, March 16th, 2024. 60 degrees, beautiful day, sunny, warm breezy and we're back again today to see if we're going to need to do another spray treatment uh, to exterminate those bees in this tree that we cannot rescue because we can't reach them to rescue them and we need to make this property safe so let's go up and take a look with the scope cam and see if they're up there today So here we are looking at the scope cam point of view and as you see as we enter the tree right away you can see more bees and what we believe this is is probably new bees that have been born out of pupation cells since the last time we were in the tree. There's also probably plenty of them that were just simply hiding and we couldn't hit them last time we treated with the spray which is all soap and water and essential oil so if they simply hide underneath a piece of comb or something then we won't hit them directly and if they don't get hit directly this treatment does not kill them because there's nothing poisonous in the tree there does seem to be less of them significantly less of them in population every time we come in to this tree so the treatment every day or two or every few days is enough to be knocking them out slowly but surely and there's no poisonous residue left for any other life forms in the future for that tree, which is very important. As you can see here, the deceased bees from the previous treatment are still laying around the nest. And usually, honeybees will remove their dead pretty quickly if they're in a healthy colony with a pretty good-sized population. And since this isn't happening very rapidly, that also tells us that the bees are starting to feel the distress and the last survivors here 
are likely new bees that have just pupated out. Because what they'll do in these colonies that overwinter in trees and places like that is they'll create a lot of brood in the winter sometimes, and all those will start popping out like popcorn in the springtime when the weather warms up like this. Even though we're still in late winter, there has been enough warm days that it does feel like spring a little earlier than it should around here lately, especially with climate change. Everything's happening sooner in the year than it would have normally. The winters are shorter and wetter, and the springtime comes earlier. Plants blossom sooner. The temperatures are higher earlier in the year. And that just makes everything start to work like it's springtime, even though it isn't yet. So we just took a minute here to observe these bees. It's an amazing colony that they've built inside this tree. And it's amazing they've been able to live in it perfectly comfortably all winter long, despite some frigid temperatures, even though it was warmer winter than we usually have. All right, let's get spraying. There were still some pretty real cold days with snow and ice, but it didn't affect them at all. Here they are. All right, so as you can see, there's plenty of bees right there. Let's see if we can spray over the scope cam without destroying it and try to get these bees. Here we go, let's see how it looks. Yeah, not too much. Go around the other side, do the same thing on the other side. And then we come back and check on it. All right, so we're on the other side of the tree. We just started with spraying on this side. Now we're coming over here. We want to observe this bee because it might tell us where there's another entry hole. Yesterday, one like this came out to attack and showed us this hole over here where it was just trying to go in again. So far it appears that this bee has no way to get home. And that's exactly what we were hoping to see because now this would indicate that maybe these three holes, one, two, and three, are the only ones in play. Or maybe this bee would have gone home quicker. But now it's just sort of hovering around the other holes and that's there's a couple now that have come out so we're going to just watch these bees try to figure out how they're getting in and out so they definitely want to get back in there So we've got this accessible now. Let's pull this out and see if there's any activity right behind it. All right, let's send in the scope cam. Try to get a better look. dead from yesterday on this side.
nothing visible here but dead ones. As we moved into the other holes, we found one bee here, one bee there, struggling, but really the vast majority were killed again right away by the spray. It's amazing as you look through the interior of a beehive like this, a feral hive in the wild inside a tree, how much unbelievable engineering they can do. Some survivors, at least one or two. Let's go ahead and spray a little bit more while we have the cam on it.
So we keep spraying off and on every few minutes until the scope cam shows no more sign of life inside that nest anywhere we look. So as of the end of the March 16th application of this spray, everything we saw in the nest was like this. It's deceased. The bee is covered in oil, soap, and water. It dies immediately because it can't breathe. It just instantly perishes, and then there's no more movement in the nest. And once we verify that for the day, we're done, and we'll come back again and check it later. At that point, more brood might pop out of the cells that are currently covered and not getting hit by the, the solution, and that's okay. We'll just take that next wave out on the next visit. The best we can do in a situation like this is just make sure we don't leave toxics or poisons behind in the ecosystem. Everything we use is safe for the environment. It's biodegradable, and there will be every opportunity later in the year for this same tree cavity to develop life forms that are not dangerous to the residents that live on this property. And that's important because trees are an ecosystem in and of themselves. They have all kinds of life forms in them that should be allowed to use this space. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for riding along with us. Have a good one.